that song was a blessing that makes me think of the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ. What a blessing to be able to say, I am my beloved's, and he is mine. We're going to look at Psalm 40, uh, those first four verses, but I'd like to read some scriptures first. The Lord said to his disciples, and beginning at Moses and in all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And then he said in verse 44, and he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Now, would you turn back to Psalm 40? And the first way to view every psalm is to view it as the words of the Lord Jesus Christ himself speaking in the first person. Every psalm ought to be read that way. All 150 psalms are Messianic psalms and should be read first as the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you can be reading the psalms, and I love to read the psalms. And the closest I think I ever come to prayer is when I read a psalm. And it speaks so really to my heart. And there are times when it's David speaking along with the Lord, and David is giving the experience of his heart. For instance, when David says in Psalm 22, verse 1, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You know that those are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ from the cross. But they were also words from David, how he felt. He felt like he had been forsaken by the Lord. So these are Christ's words, but we can also see where they're David's words as well. But look in verse 6 of this psalm. Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. Mine ears hast thou opened. Burnt offering and sin offering hast thou not required. Then said I, lo, I come. In the volume of the book it's written of me, I delight to do thy will. O oh my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. Now, are those the words of David? No. Yes, he penned them. But this is not a reference to David. This fits only one person, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. David couldn't say this except as he was speak, Christ is speaking through him. And this is quoted in Hebrews chapter 10 as being the very words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now look in verse 11 of Psalm 40. Withhold not thou thy tender mercies from me, O Lord. Let thy loving kindness and thy truth continually preserve me, for innumerable evils have compassed me about. Mine iniquities have taken hold upon me so that I'm not able to look up. They're more than the hairs of my head. Therefore my heart faileth me. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Now those are David's words. That's David's confession of his sin and oh, how it distressed him. But these are also the words of the Lord Jesus Christ from the cross. He owned our sins as his own. So yes, David is expressing himself and you've expressed yourself that way. But this is also the words, the direct words of the Lord Jesus Christ when he was made to be sin. Now, let's look at verse 1. I waited patiently for the Lord. Now you and I could say, I waited impatiently for the Lord. And that would be an accurate description, wouldn't it? Is there any time in your experience you could say, I waited patiently? For the Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ did 
wait patiently for the Lord. It takes perfect faith to have perfect patience, and he possessed both. When he was unjustly accused, he waited patiently for the Lord. When he was brought before the high priest and those accusations are brought against him, he didn't open his mouth. He waited patiently for the Lord. When he's brought before Pontius Pilate and Herod and they make fun of him and mock him, he waited patiently for the Lord. When he's brought before the soldiers and they beat him with a cat of nine tails on the back and brought furrows in his backs when they ripped out his beard by the roots, when they spit on him and hit him, when they nailed him to the cross, he waited patiently for the Lord. When he cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You see, he really was forsaken. Something you and I don't really know anything about. He really was forsaken. But even then, when he cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Even then, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And he waited patiently on the Lord. The patience of Christ, because he trusted his Father Perfectly, and he was perfectly patient through all of this. I waited patiently upon the Lord. And he inclined to me, and he heard my cry. Now let's look at verse 2. He brought me up also out of an horrible pit out of the miry clay and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. Now, I have heard people use this as their experience and I understand that to some degree. You know, we sing the song, huh, uh, he lifted me out of the deep, miry clay and settled my feet on the straight, narrow way. We sing that song. And as I am united to him, he did lift me out of this miry pit and out of this miry clay. As I'm united to him. Hold your finger there and turn to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 20, I mean. Verse 20, Matthew chapter 20, verse 20. Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? She said unto him, Grant that these my two sons, James and John, may sit the one on thy right hand and the other on thy left in thy kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, You know not what you ask. Are you able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of? And to be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? And they said unto him, We're up to the task. We're able. Yes, we can do this. Now, the Lord doesn't rebuke him. And he saith unto them, You shall drink indeed of my cup. And be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with. You see, when Christ suffered, I suffered. That's the point. Whatever he experienced, I experienced in the person of my substitute. When he was baptized under the wrath of God, I was too. Now, what is being spoken of? by the Lord through David is what Christ went through on Calvary's tree. 
He brought me up out of an horrible pit, out of the miry clay. Now, a pit, what that is a reference to is a place where you were lowered down into and a stone was put over it and you were in complete, utter darkness. The miry clay was mud and human feces mixed together. And what a horrible existence that would be. And that's what he's referring to when he was cut off from God, when he was forsaken by God. This is what he's talking about when he was in Christ, was in, in hell on the cross. Total darkness. The Lord Jesus experienced what only he could. The fullness of hell. I mean, you can't experience that. You know the reason somebody goes to hell, the reason it lasts forever and it will never end is because that sinner suffering that wrath can never satisfy the justice of God. God could never say with regarding the death of any sinner, that's enough. I'm satisfied. I'm completely satisfied. I don't need anything else. But when the Lord Jesus Christ suffered God's wrath, he experienced the full equivalent of hell. And his father said, it's enough. I'm satisfied. Nothing else is needed. And this is what is being referred to chiefly. Yes, David felt like he was brought out of the miry pit, and out of the, uh, no doubt, but what this is referring to first is the Lord Jesus Christ and what he suffered on Calvary's tree. He suffered the fullness of hell and he made complete satisfaction. But look in Psalm 38 for a moment. This, this gives us some idea of what our Lord was experiencing on Calvary's tree. Look in Psalm 38. O oh Lord, now, this is David speaking, I realize that, but first, this is Christ speaking. O oh Lord, rebuke me not in thy wrath, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. For thine arrows stick fast in me, and thy hand presseth me sore. There's no soundness in my flesh because of thine anger, neither is there any rest in my bones because of my sin. For mine iniquities, are gone over my head as in heavy burden. They're too heavy for me. My wounds stink and are corrupt because of my foolishness. This is Christ speaking from the cross. I'm troubled. I'm bowed down greatly. I go mourning all the day long for my loins are filled with a loathsome disease and there is no soundness in my flesh. I'm feeble. And sore broken, I've roared by reason of the disquietness of my heart. Lord, all my desires before thee, and my groaning is not hid from thee. My heart panteth, my strength faileth me. As for the light of mine eyes, it also is gone from me. My lovers and my friends stand aloof from my sore. My kinsmen stand afar off. They also that seek after my life lay snares for me, and they seek my hurt, speak mischievous things, and imagine deceits all the day long. But I as a deaf man heard not, and I was as a dumb man that opened not his mouth. Thus I was as a man that heareth not, and whose mouth are no reproofs. For in thee, O Lord, do I hope. He never ceased to hope in God. Thou wilt hear, O Lord my God, for I said, Hear me, lest otherwise they should rejoice over me when my foot slippeth. They magnify themselves against me, for I am ready to halt. And my sorrow is continually for me. Yes, David felt that way, and you felt that way, and I felt that way before as well. But these are the words of the Lord from the cross. And then he says, For I will declare mine iniquity. I will be sorry for my sin. Do you know he's the only one who experienced true sorrow for sin? I mean, you don't really understand what that means. I mean, we're too hard-hearted. We, uh, we don't understand the gravity of sin. He did. What it is to sin against God. And he was sorry. He experienced this true sorrow 
for sin. But mine enemies are lively and they're strong and they that hate me wrongfully are multiplied. They that render evil for good are mine adversaries because I follow the thing that good is. Forsake me not, O Lord. O my God, be not far from me. Make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. Now, that is what? I, good grief. I'm talking about things I don't have any understanding of. I realize that. I, but that's what the Lord experienced on Calvary's tree when he was made sin for his people, when he was brought into that pit and the miry clay. But making complete satisfaction and paying the sin debt, he brought me up also out of this horrible pit. And he set my feet on a rock and he established my goings. Now those are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ and this refers to the resurrection. He brought me out of that pit. I made complete satisfaction. He brought me out of that pit and he set my feet on a rock. He established my goings. I love that scripture. Yet have I set my king on my holy hill of Zion. He is delivered from the pit. And everybody in him is delivered from the pit. You see, I was in that pit with him. Paul said, I was crucified with Christ. I was in that pit with him. All the horror of hell that he experienced. I was with him. I was in him. And when he came out of that tomb, I was with him. Now turn back to Psalm 40. <clears throat> I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of an horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock, and established my goings. And he hath put a new song in my mouth. Even praise unto our God. Now we know the subject matter of this new song. Praise unto our God. That's the subject matter of this new song. And we're going to come back to that in a moment. But I want us to consider this phrase a new song. A new song. Fresh. The gospel is always news. It's not yesterday's news. It's news you've never heard before. And if I hear the gospel right, I'm hearing it for the first time as news every time I hear it. That's the way the gospel is. It comes as news. Now, as long as I'm hearing as a sinner, it's always going to be new. And it's always going to be fresh. And when I'm not hearing as a sinner, that's when the heavenly manna will become light bread. May the Lord deliver us from that good news. Singing a new song. It's a new song they sing in heaven. I love these. His compassions are new. Every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. A new heart will I give thee. One that was not there before. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. He's a new creation. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Now, it's a shame the way preachers have talked about that passage of Scripture. I've even heard preachers say, I don't have the same sinful desires I used to have. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. What that's talking about is the new creation. That's talking about the new man. That's talking about the new nature where everything is new. The old man's just as bad as it ever was. But you've got a new man where everything is new. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things have become new. I love this statement our Lord made in Revelation 21.5. Behold, I make all things new. I can't make anything new. I can't change my history. 
up to this point in my life. I can't change anything that I've done. But he who is all powerful has given me a new history. A new history. And it's all good. This is this new song. It's what the Bible calls justification. I stand before God without guilt, perfect in his comeliness, without sin. Now that's a new song, isn't it? And you know, praise the Lord, and I say that reverently. This is more glorious to me now than it's ever been. This new history, this perfect standing before God. It's a new song. It's a fresh song. You, how, how many songs have you heard that you like for a long time, but they get old, they get stale, and they even become irritating? Not this song. This song is new. First time you've ever heard it, every time you hear it. And as long as I'm hearing as a sinner, that's the way I'm going to hear this new song. It's a new song. And, if you, and, if, and of this you can be sure, in this new song, all the praise, all the glory goes to God. Notice what he says. Verse 3, he hath put a new song in my mouth. Even praise unto our God. How much of the glory of your salvation goes to God? It all does, doesn't it? To God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. It all goes to God. You see, it's what He has done. Look back at Psalm 22. Psalm 22. This is what is known as the Psalm of the Cross. That's where he talks about his then piercing his hands and feet and so on. But look in verse 30. A seed. A seed. God's seed shall serve him. It shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born, birthed, given life to, that he hath done this. That's our message, isn't it? He hath done this. Now, back to our text. Here is the result of all of this. And this is actually what I named or titled this message. Many shall see, fear, and trust. Verse 3, He hath put a new song in my heart, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it, and fear, and shall trust in the Lord. Seeing, fearing, and trusting. Now the first word I like thinking about is many. Many. Not everybody, but a whole lot. Many. The Son of Man gave his life a ransom for many. Now Christ died for an exact number of people. There's not going to be any empty chairs in heaven. But it's a great multitude. It's many. And if you're someone who needs his grace, there's room in heaven for you. You don't have to worry about not having a chair. If you're somebody who needs his grace, you're one of these many. Now many shall see, perceive, understand, gaze upon. Many shall see. That's where you've got to begin. There's something to be seen. You can't believe something you haven't seen. You can't believe something you haven't heard. There's something to be seen. You're going to see who he is. Now many shall see him. Now, turn back to Psalm 22, and while you're turning there, I want to quote a scripture from, I, from Ephesians 5.30. We are members of His body, of His flesh, and of His bones. And you remember how it said, not a bone of His shall be broken? Now, we are the bones of Christ. We are the body of Christ. The bone, not one bone is broken. Now, look at this verse in Psalm 22, verse 17. This is the Lord speaking from the cross. He says, I may tell, I may count, I see all my bones. They look 
and stare upon me. And isn't that what we're doing right now? Looking and staring upon him. When our Lord was on the cross, he saw his bones, his body, his bride, every one of his people. And what were they doing? Same thing we're doing right now. We're looking upon, staring upon him. What else is there to look at? Who else is there to look at? Christ crucified is, is the most glorious thing. And we, we look, the bones, even then, looking upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Now many shall see. Paul said to Ananias, The God of our fathers hath chosen thee, that thou shouldst know his will, and see that just one, and hear the voice of his mouth, for thou shalt be his witness to all men of what you've seen and what you've heard. Now you're going to see who God is through the sign of the cross. The only way you're ever going to really know God, who he is, what he's like, is through the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every attribute of God is manifested. You're going to see who you are in light of the cross. You're going to see that you're nothing but sin. And you're going to see through the light of the cross that you're, that you're nothing but pure holiness and righteousness. You see both things. You see that in and of yourself, you're nothing but sin, but by that one offering, he hath perfected forever, absolutely perfect them that are righteous. I love what that uh, woman uh, at the well said in John chapter 4 when she came to the people in the village. He, she said, come see a man who hath told me all things I ever did. All I ever did was sin. That's it. All I ever did was be perfect in the Lord. Now, that's what you see when you see Him. You'll see who Jesus Christ really is. I love that hymn, and evil long I took delight unawed by shame or fear until a new object caught my sight and stopped my wild career. Here's the evidence that someone has seen. Now many shall see, and here's the evidence of seeing. They'll fear. Now that's the evidence of seeing. He's talking about that reverential awe and fear of God. Now I'm not talking about the fear of punishment. That's not what the Lord's talking about. You know, you can be an unbeliever and be scared to death of being punished. You can be scared to death of being sent to hell and have all kinds of fear in that sense. A lot of people have that. But that's not the fear that's being spoken of, that, that fear of reverential awe of the Lord, His glory, His greatness, His majesty, His power, His holiness, His justice, who He is, who He is. And there's a fear. That's the fear of the Lord that's the beginning of wisdom. And in reality, this is worship. Fearing God is worshiping God for who He is. And this fear is something that only the believer has. And it's actually the summary of what the new nature is. It fears God. And when you fear God, you know what? You're afraid to look anywhere but Christ only as everything in your salvation. You're scared to death to look anywhere but Christ when you really have this reverential fear and awe of God. It's not just the fear of punishment or the fear of pain or the fear of loss. It's an awe of God. Turn with me to Psalm 130. This is the new nature. You know, the old nature, I'm, I'm, well, let me read this. Um, Psalm 130, verse 1, Out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If thou, Lord, shouldst mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? But there is forgiveness with thee, that thou mayest be feared. Now, if you and I ever come to understand how God forgives sinners 
through Christ. You know what it's going to create? Fear. Awe. Reverence. What a glorious God. What a God-glorifying thing to do. There's forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared. Now turn to Psalm 36. Psalm 36. Verse 1. The transgression of the wicked saith within his heart. There's no fear of God before his eyes. Didn't read that right, did I? Didn't read that right at all. Look at this. The transgression of the wicked saith within my heart. My heart. That there's no fear of God before his eyes. You know who that wicked is? Me. My old man. And the transgression of the wicked saith within my heart. There's no fear of God in the natural man. There's fear of punishment. There's fear of loss. But there's no fear of God. There's no fear of God before their eyes. You know, people talk about good, God-fearing people. There's no such thing. Somebody might be religious, but they're not a good, God-fearing person. Only the believer truly fears God. Now, many shall see. And what's the evidence of seeing? You fear. And what do folks do who fear? Look back in our text in Psalm 40. Many shall see, many shall fear, and shall trust in the Lord. Now here's what happens when somebody sees. Here's what happens when somebody fears. They trust in the Lord. All their hope is in the Lord. Nowhere else. Paul put it this way. He said, oh, that I may win Christ and be found in him. Not having my own righteousness, which is of the law. I don't want to have anything to do with that. I want to simply be found in him so that all God sees when he sees me is Jesus Christ. I'm in him, united to him. We are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit. Rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence. No confidence. No confidence in the flesh. Now what is it to trust Christ? I, I said this in the last week or two, but I think it bears repeating. I think it, it, it helps me to understand what it is to trust Christ, because I want to trust Him, don't you? I want to trust Him. I myself, I want to trust Jesus Christ the Lord. What does it mean to trust Him? I love that uh, passage in Ephesians 1, 12, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. Now, God the Father trusted the Lord Jesus Christ with the salvation of the elect. When Christ stood as their surety. Now, when Christ stood as my surety and I was given to him by the Father, how much... Did the Father look to me for my salvation? He didn't look for anything, did he? He looked wholly to his Son, my surety. Now we're to trust the Lord Jesus Christ the same way the Father trusted him. We trust him only. Everything God requires of me, he looks to Christ for. Everything God requires of me, I look to Christ for. Many shall see, many shall fear, and many shall trust in the Lord. Verse 4, blessed is that man. Blessed by God. Blessed by God. God's done this. This is the work of His grace in His heart. Blessed is the man that maketh the Lord his trust. He's not trusting in himself. He's not trusting in his works. He's not trusting in religion. He makes the Lord his trust. He will not look any other way. And you find me somebody who looks to Christ only 
and I'll show you somebody that God, the God of glory, has poured his blessing upon. Blessed, oh, how happy, how blessed is the man that maketh the Lord his trust. And you know what happens when you trust the Lord? It, this, is, this is part of it. If you trust the Lord, you don't respect the proud or such as turn aside the lies. Somebody that's proud of himself and his salvation, taking credit for it, you've got no respect for that. It's offensive to you. That person who turns aside the lies of salvation by works, salvation by something other than Christ, you've got no respect for that. You've got no regard for that. Why? Because you've seen him you fear and you've trusted him only. And you reject everything. Now, if you don't do this, you haven't really trusted. If you trust, you'll reject that which brings on pride, human works, that which is lies, not according to the truth of the gospel. I like what um, Spurgeon said, he that doesn't hate the false doesn't love the true. And David, the man after God's own heart, said, I esteem all thy precepts and all things to be right, and I hate every false way. Now the need of the hour is to see. And I can't see unless he gives me eyes to see. Lord, give me eyes to see. You give me those eyes to see, and I'm going to fear and I'm going to trust in the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we ask in Christ's name that we might be enabled to see who thy son is, what he did. Lord, reveal him to us Enable us to see him. Lord, we're like those men of old. We would see Jesus. And Lord, we want to see him. And oh Lord, that it would produce this holy fear, that fear that's clean, enduring forever. The, oh Lord, we want to fear you. Unite our hearts to fear your name. And Lord, enable us to trust in him only. And bless this message for your glory and for our good. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Matt, leave some closing in, please.